Harper with the City of Mansfield. Thank you, Gloria. Good morning. Uh, Jason Moore, City of Mansfield, Executive Director of the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I am a, a department of the city, but we also function with a type A sales tax. So we have um, an approach that's a little bit unique in the Metroplex. Um, but glad to be here, glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. And Peter Tokar with McKinney Economic Development Corporation. Thank you, Gloria. Good morning, uh, Peter Tokar, uh, the other MEDC up here, the McKinney Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I'm president of the organization and have been uh, for the last five years, and uh, we're doing some great stuff up there. I'm eager to tell you about it. Hi, and I'm Cherie Gordon. I'm with the City of Fort Worth Economic Development. I'm a dedicated resource for business development at the city. Um, in a team also with a resource for innovation and entrepreneurship, reporting up to Robert Stearns. Um, in our direct team, we're about 10 in total, about approaching 20. Um, but uh, just really excited to be here and to share more about our um, business attraction. All right, so let's get started with the first question around city tools and policy. So can you tell us a little bit, we'll start with Peter at the end. Um, how does your city and economic development corporation strategically fund innovation? How is it mission-based? What does it look like for you all? Sure. Um, so, so I've been with McKinney now for five years, and before that I was in uh, Georgia, just in a community just north of Atlanta uh, called Alpharetta, and there we... Uh, that's one of the tech hubs of the Atlanta metro region, and there we developed a lot of really creative programs around how do we uh, leverage the technology companies that we have and build a pipeline for future technologies. And we did that with some successful organizations over there, which then um, I was recruited over to McKinney and kind of to do a lot of the same. So McKinney is a little bit different than Alfredo. There are a lot more uh, growth, we have a lot of land, and so one of the things that we focused on as a critical mission was uh, in absence of large-scale um, buildings and lots of real estate that we have to offer uh, yet, the, the, we're starting to build the buildings now, but innovation and promoting the innovation ecosystem uh, came up to the forefront as th this is a way for us to organically home grow companies. Um, every major tech company out there um, pretty much started uh, as a few people or a small startup at some point. And so we looked at our opportunity of, well, in absence of major blocks of real estate to offer uh, these corporate relocations right now, we have the opportunity to invest in earlier stage companies, you know, those tech companies of the future and so we built, um, as one of our, our critical missions uh, for the EDC, what we call the Innovation Fund. And that is geared at funding. Uh, we have two different uh, platforms for it. We have our growth fund, and then we have our innovation fund. Growth fund is for very early stage startups. Um, it's capped at around $50,000. And it's for really just kind of, they're continuing to, these are, these are the bootstrappers. They have a minimum, you know, we have a vetting process that we uh, put them through to, you know, uh, evaluate whether, we should invest or not. Um, a lot of them make it, a lot of them don't. Uh, and then we have a, a graduation fund from that to the innovation fund, which is uh, around $500,000, and that's for really scaling the business, helping them really grow. And um, we've we put that into place uh, in COVID of all times. You know, we launched it around mid-2020, and the response was amazing. So while other communities were uh, figuring out what they're going to do, we, we just sprinted ahead, and we had, I think, 20 companies funded that first year. And currently today we have 34 companies uh, funded that we've funded um, all with about a, uh, call it around a 93% success rate of those companies. Some, several of them have already scaled to uh, Series A funding. Uh, so innovation and promoting uh, business and startups was, was a critical mission of us day one uh, when I came here. And it's proving to be a, the, the net benefit, so the net benefit of those 34 companies is equal to um, what you would get from your traditional major corporate relocation. So out of those, around 600 and 680 jobs have been created, and uh, the real estate de demand for that has been around 100, 150,000 square feet, uh, but all in blocks of 1,000 square feet. 3,000 square feet. You know, we have that all around the city that we can we can locate those. So, um, it's been a mission. It continues to be a mission. We're trying to we're continually expand that program to reach out to get more. Uh, but we've had a lot of great success with it thus far. 
I think it's really inspired a movement across the region and even nationally other cities have really looked to McKinney and trying to understand um, how you really spur that innovative growth. Fort Our Worth. secret sauce. Is yeah. <laughs> Fort Worth is another great city. Yeah, Wallet Hub recently announced that Fort Worth was the number one place to start a business. So we're doing something right, we feel like, right? So you'll have to forgive me as I look at my phone a little bit uh, to look at my notes. But one of those things is our uh, target industries. So we had a strategic plan in 2017 that we refreshed in 2022 to really get tailored with what are we trying to attract to Fort Worth. That's going to be mobility, transportation, energy, aerospace defense, and biosciences. And um, we have innovation zones that we have recently gotten through in our incentive policies. So those innovation zones are mobility innovation zone, which we've talked about a long time up at Alliance and with Hillwood, but we just didn't have that geographic region defined, and our medical innovation zone. And so that's going to be the result of a lot of focus in biosciences. I guess you would say like the ecosystem originally starting around Alcon, in South Fort Worth and then growing in with our medical district and then with a heavy leader with UNT Health S Sciences Center in Fort Worth and then there's um, Techstars and HSC and a lot of uh, momentum that's been um, uh, in that space. All right, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Mansfield? Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're probably more in the infancy stage compared to the other cities that are represented here. Uh, we've taken, you know, I'm a puzzle guy. I like to do puzzles and stuff um, with my kids. And thinking about what you start with, typically with the corners and the edges and work your way in, you know, we, we look to McKinney for the innovation programs that they've developed and have been very successful at. City of Dallas with their incentive policy and then City of Fort Worth with their strategic plan. We keep an eye on that just probably as much as you. Um, but they're great foundations and tools that we, we're trying to build into our own program. So we're, we're starting um, kind of the infrastructure side of things when, when it comes to innovation and building that, that ecosystem. Uh, we've got a, um, a corridor that we've kind of branded as our, uh, the link, which is an innovation corridor up 287 and Heritage Parkway. And we don't have office product outside of medical in the city of Mansfield. There's no class A office. And that's been a challenge for some other cities in the Metroplex, and uh, we've gotten a little um, aggressive. The council wants us to, to go after uh, the, the companies that are coming in from Silicon Valley and, um, and others. And so we've partnered with a, a local firm that's mission-driven, that, that wants to see innovation, collaboration, and it's a, um, it's a, it's a project that will kind of spearhead this corridor. But I want to say the very first person when I got to Mansfield about 18 months ago that really gave us this idea was Mike Hoke, um, who's here. And he's doing a project for us in our downtown that will transform our historic downtown and that will have an innovation uh, component to it. And so I appreciate your vision, Mike, and your team, uh, what you guys have done. It's really uh, kind of helped snowball this process for us. All right, Madge, at the city of Dallas. We're a little bit on the quiet side. Uh, last year, we've undertaken a major effort uh, in economic development moving forward. Obviously, a city has to be dynamic and ever-changing in order to thrive. And so what, what the city council adopted is the uh, economic development policy, a major initiative for us, as well as the incentives policy that my colleague has talked about. Uh, the incentives policy is really focused on workforce development, it's work, it focused on investments in Southern Dallas, it's focused on innovation opportunities. We're not only a partner, but we're also a cheerleader uh, for innovation opportunities. So there's been a lot of focus on it and identifying a public purpose for all of those. Obviously, uh, investment in time and energy with the college district, uh, the school districts because what we want to do is we want to grow the workforce organically and I think that's really really important and focus not only creating those opportunities for the locals but also uh, creating those great job and, and salaries for that um, uh, and, and the audience is my awesome uh, director of economic development Robin Bentley raise your hand um, she's also working on uh, some innovation districts, some that is 
an initiative by the mayor, five specific districts for um, um, innovation and, and entrepreneurship. Uh, but there's one specific that we're currently working on and that's gonna be kind of an encompass of all kinds of opportunities, whether it's in the medical field, the education, technology, all of that. So we're looking forward uh, to the opportunity. You know, there's been talks about, about Dallas being the next financial district in, in, in the country. If not in the world, we were able to attract Goldman Sachs. Uh, so they have their next headquarters here with us. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, been able to keep Neiman Marcus in the city of Dallas, and that's, that's a great deal for us. But we've been able to attract a lot of large companies and small companies. And there still is a lot of work to do when it comes to innovation and purpose-driven uh, uh, types of uh, economic development projects and uh, the So Good District is one of the districts that we're focused on. It's not far from City Hall and it's going to be an incredible thing, not just for Dallas, but for the entire region. So I want to touch on one thing that keeps being mentioned here, which is organic growth. So we know the region has been booming and there have been a lot of companies relocating here and bringing talent with them as well. So just in Frisco alone, we still add 800 to 1,000 residents to the city of Frisco every month are joining our community. We know companies are also coming in. We are a major workforce tech talent corridor along with McKinney and Allen. We have two times the national average of tech workers in Frisco and Collin County. Um, so we know just organically it's happening, right? These companies are coming, the talent is coming, um, and our job really here is to provide these opportunities for them. Um, with that, I think it's important to note, we lose 86% of our workforce in Frisco every day. About 81,000 residents leave the city for jobs outside of the community. And I was talking to Jason and he said, oh, well, our number's 94%. So I thought, well, we're not doing too bad. Um, but it is really just this war on talent. So you look at companies and companies are looking where the talent is relocating. Um, and then you look at the cities and we're also trying to capture our own intellectual capital as well as the revenue that's leaving. So during COVID, we did see in Frisco, we had a drop from 86% to 74% of labor shed. And that was really due to remote work and people being able to stay at home. With that, there was a direct correlation to our sales tax revenue, which jumped 24% to the tune of $30 million that we were able to keep within the community when we kept our talent. So there's really this war for talent in terms of revenue for the city, as well as being able to hold on to your intellectual capital. However, I think I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how do you protect your taxpayer dollars when you're investing in high-risk portfolios like innovation and startups? You don't necessarily know if a startup is going to make it or an innovation is really going to innovate and it's going to work. So how do you go about, as a city and economic development organization, um, in making some risky decisions and investing 50000 or what it may be into a company and not really knowing if it's going to have an ROI for your community? I'll start. I don't know that we have the innovation fund like like was mentioned with McKinney. What we do have is we have an R and D um, tax credit incentive policy, and so if a company is coming in and they're not having the heavy investment, but they're going to have quite a bit of R and D, then it's a um, tax credit that can be sold. So um, they can earn that based on their R and D expense, and then that also um, is a um, funding mechanism coming in for the company. So that's one uh, piece that we've added to our toolbox to kind of address the thing that you're talking about. Um, just in general on startups and investments, we're retooling, we're in a business assistance center um, is where we're located and our, we're, we'll be moving to our Pier Blend building downtown. But we've added a small business resource uh, to our team and he really trying to hit the ground on how to um, pull together all of the resources that are available in the community and to help help grow and support the companies that are in Fort Worth. So we have, you know, at the Business Assistance Center, we have Tech Fort Worth, we have an accelerator that's Sparkyard. Mentioned before, HSC Innovates, Tech Stars. Um, 
But one of the things I was going to mention um, with Dallas, and you'll find we're all very um, competitive but friendly at the same time, was that we recently announced an entrepreneurship and economic, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got lost on my notes, uh, We uh, an entrepreneurship center, and that is um, parallel to one that Dallas has out of uh, the former uh, Redbird area that with the DEC network. So... Um, uh, Having those support services for startup businesses we think is really key and important in developing the right ecosystem. And then also with investor networks. And so we hear a lot about that with venture capital investor networks. And um, we think that it's just a story that's not being told in Fort Worth because there are quite a bit of resources, but people just aren't aware of it. So um, Crescent is there with John Goff, TPG, David Bonderman, Crestline Investors, AFB Partners, which is Tony Akia. Uh, Perot Jane. So there's there's also a, a story to tell on VC that's available and how we can help companies with funding. Peter, do you want to talk sure, a little bit sure. about compliance? Um, so again, uh, we're we're a like all the EDCs up here. We're a Texas Type A organization. We're funded by half cent sales tax revenue. So. Um, slightly different proposition from a, a city incentive that is coming uh, via more of a chapter 380 agreement, a property tax abatement or something like that, where that's com coming from the city general revenue. So there's, there's a little bit less of a burden. Uh, there's always a burden of, of ROI when you're talking about any type of tax revenue, but when it comes to the sales tax revenue, um, we have to have mentors in place by statute. So, you know, it says in the Texas uh, statutes that govern type A organizations, uh, there has to be job creation, there has to be performance metrics. Basically, all of our agreements need to be a performance-based agreement. So, um, we've had to take a, we, it took a lot, of, a lot of work to look at, well, how do we structure a, a small investment fund that still has all of the same protections and all the same uh, guidelines that follow how we are legislatively uh, responsible for accounting for that money. And so our, our investment is not a uh, equity stake like you would think in, in a lot of other uh, tech funds and VC funds out there. Ours is a performance grant. So we've developed a, a pretty robust system of compliance metrics that are more geared towards a, a startup business rather than your, your corporation. Uh, typ typical agreements will say we have an a, uh, incentive for you for job creation. You create the jobs, you get the money. Um, or for capital investment, you build the building, you show us you know, you're going to spend $75 million, you show us you spent $75 million, we give you a capital investment grant. Uh, the metrics that we developed for the innovation fund are slightly different. They're based on more milestones and metrics that are relevant to uh, the startup community rather than a traditional economic development project. And I'll give credit to uh, um, Jennifer and Trey with North Texas Innovation Alliance. You know, they, they helped us out a lot. Uh, we, we brought them on as a, as a consultant and they helped us uh, kind of formulate what uh, traditional metrics for measuring startups are and helped us develop that rubric that we use to, to gauge them. So. Uh, if the question ever comes up, we ha we do have measurable criteria that, that we use, but it's it's on um, it's still in the veins of uh, perf a performance agreement, but just with some different levers for how they can qualify for getting uh, getting the funds. So it took a little bit of creativity, but we we made it fit within the system. So what about Magid with the city of Dallas? What are some ways that you look at protecting that task taxpayer risk when you're investing in innovation? So let me, let me start by prefacing that I wish I have that other 1% sales tax <laughs> because that's $420 million that I can conquer the world with, okay? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't have that. So we're very, uh, I if I tell you we're risk takers, we're not because we, we have the public you know, fund trust in, 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 in our hands. And so we're very, very calculative. We have uh, incentive. Uh, laden deals that that we work uh, with um, the the case that you brought with the Redbird Mall. Uh, I mean, there is there's an entrepreneur center that, that the city pumped in at least 28, 29 million dollars in it. But we're we're very performance focused on that. Um, I, I think moving forward, if I will say that is when we when we work with mission driven and innovation. Uh, 
companies. I think there's got to be a clear understanding of the risk-taking piece. And there has to be an agreement that, you know, when we partner, that the, the risk is shared, whether that it be in, in the performance, whether that be in the product, whether that would be in the innovation itself. All of that stuff has to be very deliberate in, in, in the thing. Now, we have another arm, which is the small business center that, that we have um, th that deals with the smaller opportunities, the smaller startup. And there's a huge fund for that as well. So we can tackle it from different, uh, really from different perspectives in that, uh, in that aspect. Um, can we get better? A absolutely. I mean, do we, do we have everything in order and understand what, you know, when, when we get an innovation um, a startup company or, or, or an entrepreneurship, uh, you know, coming to Dallas, uh, we'll have to work on all other details and we have the, you know, the tools to be able to do this and, and the incentives tools have been, have been fantastic for us and I think they're going to give us an additional arm uh, to continue to negotiate that. So we've talked a little bit now about encouraging innovation and startups and policies and mechanisms that cities and economic development corporations use to kind of attract those companies to our city. Let's talk a little bit about discouraging. Are there, are there industries that you um, shy away from, that you don't incentivize, that you're honest with? And I'll start with Frisco. So we are... Um, really a corporate community and a small school model. In Frisco, we are on high school number 12 now, which was just built outside of the PGA headquarters. Um, we've built 73 schools and we will max out at 85. So there's literally a school on every street in every corner in Frisco. Education is priority. With that, there's not a lot of places where you can have truck traffic or semi-trucks or logistics. We have a small distribution center to the northeast of the community. Um, and that's about it. So we really do essentially discourage industrial development, heavy use, manufacturing. It just doesn't fit within the community. And we do that by really focusing incentives on corporations, right? The corporate jobs and the corporate tax base that is there is what we focus on. So my question to the other communities, do you see that as well? And is that, is that a way you also discourage some of these mission-based companies? Start with Majid. I would never shy away from any opportunity <laughs> because I do want to have a diverse economy for the city of Dallas unless it hurts the community. So you're talking about truck traffic. We have a logistics center that we're looking at, the inland port, uh, that something that is going to be magnificent uh, that borders several cities. We're working on a, a JPA, um, a joint uh, powers uh, opportunity. Uh, with, with the county and other cities, that's going to be an incredible thing because we do need the logistics uh, hubs uh, in order for us to continue to grow our uh, opportunities. Medical, um, um, uh, you know, commerce, uh, retail, uh, warehousing, all of, all of those are really uh, important to us. But, you know, technology and, 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 and medical, and you, you've seen that uh, post-pandemic that has affected the entire world. And I think the focus for us to continue to diversify and be able to offer transportation options, uh, to offer uh, uh, different trades uh, options, uh, I think will we'll continue to keep the city thriving and, and, and moving in the right direction. Jason, you wanna talk a little bit about Maxwell? <coughs> so we're very similar to Frisco in that distribution warehouse has been something that we've discouraged, mainly because of the truck traffic. This could be a thousand trucks a day, and those are driving on your city streets, um, which is putting a toll on those. So by discouraging, we, we don't necessarily discourage if the zoning's there, we're going to support that business to come in, but we're not going to waive roadway impact fees or any other development fees that are maybe significantly higher because of that impact. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the land in Mansfield is pretty fragmented. If you kind of zoom out and you look at an aerial map, you'll see a whole lot of gas wells, just kind of sporadic. And that's, that's created some, you know, um, unfortunate, you know, zoning cases that have gone forward. Uh, so we're looking more at the form-based codes um, instead of Euclidean zoning so that we can focus on more traditional development. 
uh, that makes more sense, less, less uh, cars on the road. And by doing that, we've just kind of inherently discouraged the uh, distribution folks. McKinney, it's, it's a lot of the same that's been set up here. Um, while we'll never turn a business away, again, I think the kind of the, the theme of, of what you're hearing is uh, our, our incentive dollars are, are finite. And so we have to make strategic decisions about where to invest, about what's going to enhance the community. And so when we develop our, you know, uh, I think it was mentioned about targeted industries, all of us have done a targeted industry study to, to study uh, what are the businesses that currently make up our cities? Uh, what are the ones that are driving the growth? And those are the ones you want to focus on. But you also have to look at characteristics um, of the character of your city and on the livability. There's a lot of data out there that we use to, to look at um, what is the av Collin County average uh, wage. So if, if there's a minimum wage threshold that you need to meet just to live in that area, then incentivizing a project that provides 500 jobs, it's a, it would be a great news article, but it's gonna provide 500 to 1,000 jobs at 40% below that average wage threshold. Are you really doing your, your community a service by in using incentive dollars to bring that project to the city? Uh, it's gonna create a more transit, it's, it's like, like we said, it's gonna um, put burden on the road networks, it's gonna create more traffic, it's gonna do all these things that, you know, for a press article win, you have to live with that company now for the next 20, 30 years. So uh, we, we tend to focus on what we call high-skilled, high-wage jobs that meet, meet that minimum threshold for livability in the city as, as just a base layer, let alone somebody who could thrive within the city. And then are, are those employees um, going to be able to participate in the local economy? A big, um, everyone hears about jobs incentives. And uh, say, well, why do you why do you give out jobs incentives? Um, you know, you give three thousand dollars a job or five thousand dollars a job. Well, the benefit we get from that person being in the city is they're going to eat lunch there, they're going to buy gas there, they're going to participate in our local economy, and we will make that jobs incentive back by just them being in and around the city. So there, there's a lot of thought process. There's a lot of metrics that go into um, what kind of project are we going to do and what kind of project are we going to support from a incentive point of view. I don't think any of our companies are gonna say like, you can't come here. But if you wanna come here, that's fine, but it's gonna be on you and we're not gonna provide any support for you to move your operations here. Yeah, and I mentioned our target industries earlier. I guess I would caveat that. I, I've been with the city for a year and I come from BNSF and from American Airlines. And so those are two companies that are in the transportation sector that are corporately headquartered in Fort Worth, right? So when you think about Hillwood and Alliance and some of the companies that they're attracting up there, you have Cleavon, which is a, a, a autonomous vehicle, right? You have Too Simple. Um, so th those type of, um, you call that the transportation 4.0, right? Are, are, are the pieces we're trying to really attract into Fort Worth. It's not so much the distribution centers, as you mentioned, not because we have anything against distribution centers, but again, as McKinney mentioned, we're very focused on our average wage. We've set in our incentives policy a minimum average wage of 55,000. That's like at the low end. And so what that tends to exclude in addition to, to DCs is food industry, which we've been kind of known for for a long time, having a lot of food industry folks in Fort Worth. But again, if that average wage is not there, that's not something that we're currently incentivizing. Having said that, I think I have a food industry term sheet that I'm working on right now. I've also done a distribution center since I've been here. So um, even though we say it discourages it, with the right terms and conditions, um, as, as uh, Majed mentioned, Majid mentioned, we would certainly look at all of those opportunities, right? So um, the other piece I would mention, because I tend to uh, sort of brand myself as industrial and manufacturing, so that's interesting, but that's partly because we have Bell Helicopter, we have Lockheed Martin, so we're really thinking about that aerospace and defense. We have Elbit in Fort Worth, um, and so we'll be with some of the recent awards with Bell, There'll be opportunities to bring in additional suppliers. We're very much about a cluster effect. If we can keep them out of Mansfield, they're giving us a run for our money. Mm -hmm. but, um, but those are some of the things that, that for manufacturing, we do still look pretty strongly at manufacturing, but it's very nuanced. 
add one thing, just, and this is really important. I think the cities of, of Frisco, Fort Worth, Mansfield, and, and McKinney have, have benefited greatly from prior planning. I think Frisco, uh, you know, credit to George Purefoy, who was the previous city manager, and Maher Masso, who was the former mayor of Frisco, did a lot of planning, did a lot of infrastructure. They knew they wanted to be the corporate headquarters of, 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 of Texas. And I think that was important. Now Frisco is reaping the benefit, in, in my opinion, because I watch everyone. Uh, and I think the cities, the other cities, need to learn from that model. I know McKinney did that somewhat and did a great job of it. The city of Dallas will continue to do this. We don't have a lot of infrastructure in Dallas is missing, especially in the Southern District. And so for us, part of the incentives policy is to focus on infrastructure and making sure that corporations and innovation hubs have the ability to go in there with not as much capital worrying about permitting and, and worrying about putting infrastructure and taking four or five years in order for them to, uh, you know, initiate their opportunities, right? Which that could be loss of time, money, and energy. And so that's how we can, that's how we can lose or gain uh, uh, corporations and opportunities in Dallas. So we need to work on that aspect as well. How, how fast can we uh, entitle? How fast can we get permitting? How, how, you know, how fast can we work on incentives deals? All of those are really, really important in the success of the whole region. So the speed of business, right, is really our mission when we're, we're at this mission-based conference. And I think for cities, our mission is really driving business and driving business opportunities within our communities. As I mentioned up here, salaries, wages, a good place to live, right? You want to be a part of a thriving community. Um, so my next question is really, how do we continue to build future cities and what do they look like while we continue to main this, maintain this sense of place for future generations? What are cities that you look to that are thriving? Um, and what do you want the future of your cities to incorporate? I'll continue again. So um, in the city of Fort Worth for the last two years, we've uh, been at the Smart Cities Expo World Congress and very much have an interest in smart cities and looking at those cities that are pioneers in that area. Um, and part of that, we're, look, we're kind of forward looking to what those next industries are. So as an example, I would give like robotics as a service. We think that is a nice emerging industry that would fit well in Fort Worth. We have a few things that, that we think that we've done to help with the future forward. One is attracting MP materials. They do rare earth mining. So the little magnets that go in everything from your phone to your uh, laptops, that company is, is in Fort Worth. And so we think that that's going to be a big asset for us going forward. We have a battery energy storage system, the BESS, which is a way to store additional energy from electrification for future electric technologies. So um, those are some of the things that we're, that we're really looking at, uh, partnering with our transportation. And uh, we talked about infrastructure a little bit, but partnering also with our transportation departments for transit-oriented development and how that looks going forward. And getting rid of our ego and, and saying we're going to learn from everyone. In the Smart City World Conference, I think we're partnering with Fort Worth. We're going to have one booth together, so we're going to go as a, as a region and, and try to not only uh, observe but learn from what other cities have done. Um, you've got cities like uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, they've, they've, they've got an application right now where they go to grocery outlets and, and restaurants and repackage things at a third of the cost um, for the consumers. You, you've got Vancouver, British Columbia with a smart canister, trash canister. You know, you've got, you've got smart lighting, you've got uh, smart technology, artificial intelligence, all of those. I think we need to be open wide uh, in, in, in looking at at, at some of those opportunities, just focusing on them and attracting those businesses. Anything that can help our community not only be sustained but also grow is something that we should look at. And uh, we're looking at everything, basically. I came from the infrastructure world, 
and I don't think there's anything technology I haven't looked at. But now I'm in economic development, so yeah. you know I've switched my, my hat completely, and now I'm focused on a much larger scale than, than just the infrastructure piece. Jason, how about Mansfield? Yeah, so we've got about 25% of our land left. All of our single family homes that are currently under construction, we've got 30,000 doors coming to South Mansfield down to Middle Othian uh, that are permitted, zoned, um, entitled for residential. And so we know that growth is gonna, it's gonna keep coming. Um, it hasn't slowed down much. Um, and so what do we do with that last 25%? We've really focused on these mixed use developments. If you've read the Dallas Business Journal with Mansfield, you'll see probably every month we, we try to put out some kind of mixed use uh, topic to really kind of bring awareness that uh, Mansfield's about that kind of interfacing to where we, we mix all the uses, we bring all the partners together, the community stakeholders, academia to the, the healthcare industries. Um, that's our sustainable future for us, um, is, is bringing those uh, communities so people aren't commuting 45 minutes outside of the city, but also having attainable housing. So we've got some in our innovation district, um, office buildings that we're partnering with, um, developers that are, that are here in the audience today. And they're also providing some residential components that uh, would be corporate residences for those people that would come and work there. Um, instead of building the apartments first, and then those people have to drive somewhere to go work, we're building the office first. And so we've kind of flipped that a little bit. Um, and so it's really, you know, like Majad said, the, the infrastructure is key, uh, making sure you get that right. And so that's where we're focused. It's really fascinating. We're on complete opposite ends of the Metroplex, you could fold us in half and we couldn't be more similar. So Frisco, same with our workforce leakage, you mentioned 25% of your land left. We only have 16% of our land available for development in Frisco, so we're reaching build out. We're at about 225,000 people, as I mentioned, still adding about 1,000 a month, but we will max out about 325,000. So we're you know, pretty, pretty far into the growth and it's really starting to become about sustainability. And then, and then there's McKinney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so a, a little bit different from all the cities here. We're, we're 113 square miles. Uh, we're about 65 developed. So we have loads of land available. Uh, and so that gives us kind of a pretty unique opportunity in that the best time to put in infrastructure of the future is when it's still dirt. Uh, because so we're working with our developers. Uh, we actually, the EDC, we incentivize all of our new developments to put in uh, more advanced fiber networks uh, to bury power, to put in 5G infrastructure with small cells throughout the development. We will help and incentivize the developer to do that, uh, to tr try to get that next generation, that next city technology in the ground to support those industries of the future. Um, Infrastructure, but yeah, infrastructure is is key. So, um, but it's not cheap. So that that's where we're trying to uh, look at that. We've recently launched a citywide broadband initiative to bring bro broadband to the entire city, um, uh, in in our underserved neighborhoods for free uh, on the city. So we're trying to get connectivity for all. Uh, we also have developed a um, a sustainable housing plan for looking at. Um, uh, kind of residential neighborhoods of the future. But another thing we're starting to look at too is sustainability, um, you know, and how does that play a role into the future development of the city. Uh, we're looking into some very conceptual things. I, I've also, I've been going to the Smart Cities World Congress for, for probably the past 10 years. Um, it, it is probably one of the best places to go and, and see. Europe is way ahead of us, um, just as a whole, and with, with Smart City adoption. but. Uh, we're also looking into sustainability, so there's con conceptual things out there. If you haven't looked at it, you should look it up, like things like the Toyota Woven City, um, or looking at things like uh, biophilic development, you know, the future to help put sustainability elements into office buildings and just residential neighborhoods of the future, and how all those interconnect uh, to give a better living experience from both a sustainability side and a quality of life side. So given the fact that we have opportunity to plan um, for a, a lot of this future development, uh, we're looking into you know, what do those cities look like in the future and how can we best model and uh, take best practices from them to make, really make McKinney a city of the future. Well, we're wrapping up here and I wanna ask one final question. This was courtesy of Majid. 
Um, if you had a magic wand to change some dynamic within your organization or community to make economic development better and more mission-based, what would you change and why? Let, let me see if my, one of my bosses is here. <laughs> uh, elected official decisions. Um, no, in, in all seriousness, I think engagement, engagement, and engagement. Uh, it, it is really important to um, um, engage with the development community, with the private community, to understand their business a lot more and work with them collaboratively on policies that we can change to be able to uh, do the business better, to, to streamline things better, to, to improve things better. I, I, one of the other things that I, I'm always I'm always a believer of being very proactive, but it's not about being proactive to put plans. It's about being proactive to execute plans and making sure that we have performance metrics to those plans and opportunities to go visit those and make sure that, that we are aligned with what we say we're gonna do. Oftentimes we create those incredible plans, but then when it comes to execution, I don't, see, I don't see us do a great job. So if I have a magic wand, I would say stay focused on the course, execute, take care of business, engage with everyone, and make sure that we're working together as a community, not just as a solo organization or as a solo organization in a region. Even working together as a region is imperative for us. Jason? I'm going to quote the great philosopher Mike Tyson. He said, um, you know, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And, and that's to us, you know, the plan was this zoning uh, in place that uh, then all the gas wells started showing up, which were great for the Texas economy, but horrible from a land use perspective. So we didn't have economic development featured in our land use plan. And so if I could wave a magic wand, it would be, let's see if we can consolidate where those go and we'd have a lot more opportunities to develop. Peter? I'm going to say a little bit different one. Um, if I had a magic wand, I would make everybody in the community vote. Um, a lot of great plans, a lot of great directions that cities have fail because of lack of resident and citizen participation. Uh, People may have read the news, McKinney just did a bond issue and well, proposed a bond issuance to add commercial passenger service to the McKinney National Airport. And it failed. But it failed with a whopping, I think, 9% voter turnout. So 50% of 9% uh, voted against it. Uh, I think it was a total of 12,000 votes for a city of 211,000 people. Um, and so now the council's having to go back and look at alternative ways to see if that can still happen. but. The cheapest way and the best way for the community to pay for that, they voted against based on 9% voter turnout. And that it's like that for zoning changes, for zoning ordinances. If, if residents would come out and vote more and speak up more about what they want in their community, that would help us so much in determining the direction. It would help council. It would help city leadership. It would help city staff develop better direction on where we, where we should go as a city if people would just participate. To, to, to echo a little bit of, uh, of what we were mentioning there, um, one of the things that, it, it wasn't the prepared answer I had for this, but one of the things that we're challenged with is kind of some misperceptions about um, incentives. And being a city, that's our primary tool in the toolbox, not our only tool. But we like to say, you know, it's not corporate welfare, and it's not that I'm taking your money and I'm giving it to somebody else. What we're generally talking about with a tax incentive is that, for example, one that we did was at a former Nokia facility up at Alliance, and the company that we put in there, there was no one in there. And so with a, with a tax incentive, which is they're going to pay less taxes than they otherwise would for a limited period of time, now we have a company in there and they're paying taxes for a limited period of time, not as much as we otherwise would have gotten, but now I have something and I, and, and I had nothing. So there's a lot of misperceptions out there about w what incentives are and what they mean. Um, and so that would be one thing that if I could wave a magic wand, I think that I would do on education. 
but that would segue me into what my formal answer was, <laughs> which is um, education and training. Uh, I'm very passionate about that. My son is um, in the Navy, and he went through CTE programs um, at his high school. And so I would really just love to see more um, career technical programs throughout the, the whole community and uh, preparation. And, um, you know, however we can encourage that workforce. We have great news stories in Fort Worth. We have 80,000 people that are enrolled in TCC on an annual basis in our community college. Um, we have uh, TCU is here. They have a great supply chain. We have Texas A&M coming. We have... Um, uh, Tarleton, we have UNT, so we have a lot of good news like on the college story side, um, but for, for workforce and that encouragement, I just think about personally like I think with the pandemic and with remote workforce, you saw a lot of people that really wanted that more of that connectivity with their family, right? If you're thinking about mission-based work and how do we encourage that? And so it's it's this is going to sound really random, but uh, my, I have another son It's at home looking at going in band, and in the area we have a Keller Youth Orchestra. So you have adults who have also been in band or have music, and they're able to participate with the kids in some type of format, so it's more integrated. It's not, I go see my kids, or I'm doing music over here, my kids come and see me. There's more of an integrated format. And I think just in general, outside of economic development, I think that it's Child care is a challenge. We have people that are very focused on how we can uh, improve and address child care. But I just encourage and challenge people to think outside of those models. If we're talking about the future and we're talking about innovation, like what, what do you think that should look like? And how do we build something that we all feel maybe better about um, in the future? I think that's Frisco's magic wand. For the longest, our um, mission has been progress in motion and moving forward and moving at the speed of business and, and innovating very quickly and rapidly. Um, we've been fastest growing city in the nation for the past decade, so we've had no choice, right? We've had to move quickly um, and really work to build a community, but also build it sustainably. I think our magic wand would be if we look back 25, 30 years from now at Frisco as it's fully developed and built, did we do our jobs as a city and as economic developers? You know, we just landed Universal Studios and it was there was a lot of news, negative and good, right? People who wanted it in the community, to Peter's point, a very vocal minority um, who didn't want it in the community. And so when you look back at that deal, you know, the reason why Frisco did it is today we're just a day trip city. We don't have, we have plenty of hotels, but we don't have heads and beds and we don't generate tax revenue from tourism. Economic development and tourism go hand in hand. There's some revenue to generate for cities. When we add Universal Studios, and in our work, when we looked at the study, in addition to having PGA Frisco, which kicks off its first championship this week, we now have become an overnight stay city and a weekend stay city. So that has now elevated us to really a tourism gym in North Texas, where before you would just day trip to come see the star, maybe come to the mall, and you'd go back home. Um, and now today we've captured some real tourists with Universal Studios. And so when we look to the future and we look back at the community, we want to say that we made some sort of impact. We also you know, created a thousand jobs there at Universal that didn't exist before and not in the corporate space that we typically attract. These are more service and theme park based jobs. Um, and kind of opening up the spectrum for everyone to participate in you know, d various jobs throughout the community. So I would say that would be our magic wand, um, to be able to just look back and know that we made some positive impact in the community. Um, with that, I'm gonna close and just say thank you so much. There's so much experience and talent and most importantly, passion on this panel today. Um, it's been a pleasure to have the conversation with you all and thank you so much for your time. And if we can have everyone make their way towards the auditorium, we have two fantastic back-to-back -back conversations coming up. We've got Avery Johnson and Michael Sorrell sitting down, as well as our founder, Michael Moe, speaking with world-class magician, Drummond Money Coots. Make your way to the auditorium, please.
and Dexter, our new small business.